there's a podcast where they talk about punk rock. It's not two guys stroking their cocks. It's two chicks with tits from opposite continents. They rarely check out new bands or rarely wear any pants. Shaving lady parts. They're not on the iTunes charts. Mabel Syndrome. Why am I still listening to Mabel Syndrome? Mabel Syndrome. Why am I still listening to Mabel Syndrome? Hey everyone, welcome to the Mabel Syndrome podcast. This is Kristen and I'm here with my co-host Jessica. Hi Jessica. Hello everybody. Um, we have a very special guest for this podcast today, Blake Schwarzenbach. Did I say that right? You did. All right. Singer and guitarist from Jawbreaker. Um, how are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm in Brooklyn and uh, freezing rain for the past week. Yeah. Uh, Blake, you mentioned in your email that you're heading to Olympia. Is that this month? Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm going out there in about ten days uh, for practice. We we've kind of we because Jawbreaker lives on two coasts. We've been meeting up in Olympia, where Chris lives, our base player. Um, so yeah, I'm going out there for pre-tour preparation. Does he have a good space? We have been using a a kind of a, uh, a nightclub that's under construction right now. Mm. Um, I think the thing is that there is space in Olympia for the moment. <laughs> right. Isn't, doesn't the tour start, the tour starts in Washington, doesn't it? Yeah. We're in Seattle, I think for the first show. For the first show. That's the closest show to me. That's the closest f- show that I could access, but it's about still about nine hours away. Right. <laughs> Which <laughs> which we can get into later about how devastating this whole tour announcement is for me because of how remote I am. It's one thing that's hard for me being like moving back home and stuff is I'm super far removed, but yeah, about nine hours is my closest, closest shot. Plus like a million Q-tips up my nose to get across the border and back. So <laughs> right. did you guys choose to start it there for a reason? I think logistically probably it just worked because we're going to be there with you know, the band. Yeah. I, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> but it seems like a good place to start. Might as well. Yeah. Do you, do you have much to do with planning the actual tour? I mean, we've all been, we're pretty involved in what we do as a band. Mm-hmm. Um, the, this is a little bigger than we're, we're used to, just in terms of its scope. You know, until now, until recently, we've been doing like kind of small two or three shows at a time. And we decided to try and do everything at once. Like, this is a big tour. Huge. Huge. This is the biggest tour you guys have ever done. It might be. It is. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it is. I'm telling you. I've researched. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a little intense. It is. It's a big tour. And you're selling it out repeatedly. Like shows are ridiculously selling out quickly. There's very few tickets left. And you've added numerous shows. Um, and they're selling out super quick as well. Yeah, I mean, it's been wonderful. The the you know the readiness of the peoples. Yeah. So we were all surprised just because a lot of us aren't going to shows right now. It's kind of an mm-hmm. icy proposition, but you know we're hopeful that that things are trending towards safer gatherings, and we're going to have a lot of heavy protocols in place, and like we're going to try and do it as sanely and safely as possible. What a weird dynamic from 25 years ago when the album was released to now where there's like hardcore pandemic protocols, huh? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, weird. <laughs> I mean, it's all weird. Life in general, like going to the grocery store is weird. Never mind planning a tour. So it was a different set of difficulties then, you know. I mean, I know older musicians kind of muse about how great and horrible it was to like have to seek out a pay phone <laughs> uh, and like confirm that the club was still there that you were going to. And like our first tour was very much like that. Wow. You know, showing up and having like an abandoned casino or something. It's Oh my gosh. I booked a month before. So that, yeah. 
now it's just the entire earth has turned back in on itself and it's trying to kill all of them. Mm-hmm. Eradicate the human virus, you know. Right. Yeah. How did you choose how did you guys choose the bands that are opening up for you? Because the the lineups, every single every single stop on the tour are just phenomenal. Amazing. Thanks. I mean, that's our taste. You know, we just pick bands that we liked and that seemed like they would add to the show. So you guys had hands on picking these people. This wasn't like management or like anything like that that sort of did it, but like you guys really cho- had like a lot of say in who was going to be with you guys. Oh yeah. I mean, we collaborated <sighs> with our manager because we're kind of like-minded, but it was our decision. And honestly, to be fair, like a lot of it goes to Adam, our drummer, because he's more active in kind of the book, the logistic <laughs> end of it, and frankly knows more bands than chris and i as a fan do you know how cool it is to hear that you guys had like your hands in that because like i am a fan and i'm a fan of like all the other acts that are on this tour with you but like as someone um who's a fan of jawbreaker to know that you guys like love these or are interested in these other bands is just like a little extra kind of cherry on the top kind of thing we we sort of have a joke on our podcast that our other name other than Mabel syndrome is the face to face podcast, because I'm an, I'm an idiot fan with face to face and we always bring them up on every podcast and things like that. It's kind of an ongoing joke, but like the face to face fans have a super, super, super tight following with you guys as well. It's really interesting. Like I, you know, like we, the face to face fans on the fan club and stuff are just as excited for you guys as face to face, like the two of you guys together is pretty insane. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, a couple of the combinations seem to like unlock some magical community. Yes. The descendants in Denver thing too, was just like those shows went faster than anything else. Yeah. And it was, you know, exceeded all expectations of what, what we would expect. You never know, but I mean, who are you most excited to play with? Um, boy, I like, I mean, we've been trying to play with the Linda Lindas for a long time because this tour kind of, this is like what has been pushed for the last two years. So it's very exciting that they're having like this great moment. Yes. And, um, you know, we joke that we're going to be opening for them by the time we actually get out there. That's awesome. But I mean, I'm stoked to see the descendants. Honestly, we played with them at, at, um, at Riot Fest, but it was like, it's so hectic there that we didn't, didn't get to see them really. So like Descendants is kind of a lifelong dream for me. It's a band I grew up loving and like, I like the people and I just want to see them do it. <laughs> did you guys never play together in the 90s? I don't think we actually did. We played with all once at CBGB's. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, like CBGB's was so bizarre the way they booked and I think they were on at like one in the morning and we were on at seven in the evening or something. So there wasn't really a communication. There wasn't contact. It's interesting too, like with, um, with this tour. So because there's a Jawbreaker album, like a dedicated to Jawbreaker of all the covers, Face to Face has a song on that album. So are you guys going to hit the stage together and play? Oh, that's uh, I hadn't thought of that. I haven't listened to the Jawbreaker's cover record in some time. <laughs> You mean it's not on your constant rotation? <laughs> uh, I did. I listened to it when it came out. Uh, yeah. I can't say that I'm too well versed in it. You know. Is there anybody you want to take the stage with? Uh, well, listen. You know, and, and to be honest, my I'm probably closest in spirit to Evan Dando and the Lemonheads. Like he's a yeah. songwriter that I've just followed forever, and I just really admire his talent and yeah. his his um honesty in his lyrics so like i kind of secretly have a fantasy of evan here's the cat ah the uh of evan like bum rushing the stage and actually on the jawbreaker fan club page um fans have actually talked about that quite a bit and i don't know whether it's like the age group of fans or the nostalgia of like though like you know at that that time and stuff but that has been talked about on the one of the Jawbreaker fan clubs online about how people are actually most excited for that as well. Mm. So it's a very rabid base I've noticed with the, like my fellow Lemonheads fans. 
you know, some people don't get into it and other people are like deeply devoted. Yeah. Uh, now you've had some... When you're one of those fans, you're shocked when someone isn't like moved the way you are. You're like, yeah. really? And they're like, yeah, I don't, you know, they're great. They're fine. Oh. Like, no, that's not how it is. No, it's not right. You want to change their mind. I feel it. I feel you there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you've had some issues with your voice before, Blake. So are you nervous at all about this stretch, this stretch of time? Uh, no, I mean, not, it's been good for a while. Yeah. If we were doing like the unfun album, uh -huh. I'd be a little more concerned, but these, this is kind of in a pretty good place. Yeah. For you. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how two months feels. That's a lot of singing. Yeah. I'm Can more I concerned about how many lyrics I wrote. And like how I'm going to remember all the words because there's a lot. Uh, when Face to Face got back together, they fucked up so many songs. And it was hilarious being in the crowd and Trevor would be like fumbling through and the fans in the crowd would be like carrying him on. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it would catch him up kind of thing. I don't know how people remember stuff like that. I think about that with musicians all the time. Like how, mm -hmm. how do you remember all the things? Totally. And nowhere, nowhere more for me than in the world of rap <laughs> right when mcs can just go and go and go and be totally baked at the same time uh-huh yeah true that astounding to me but i don't know i mean i memorize big blocks of text and somehow go through it mm -hmm. um can i tell you a funny story about the voice thing so um when i found i i discovered jawbreaker after you guys were already broken up, after it was done. Um, Dear You was the first album that I discovered. And it was, a, I was, I think it was like maybe 1997 or eight, maybe 1998. <clears throat> and a boyfriend, high school boyfriend had it in his car. And he was like, you got to hear this. This is amazing. And it was like a really big deal. And we listened to it driving around and around and around. And Amongst my small punk rock community, the rumor was that you guys would never play again because of your voice. And it was like this devastating, big, horrible event that all of us like lamented, like that there is this amazing music out there. And like the rumor, and I'm using rumor like full on, it was like, you couldn't talk anymore. But we had no internet to Google you. <laughs> we had no, you know, and like the far stretches of where I lived, it was like this amazing musician could never talk again. Obviously, that's not the truth. But did you ever hear those kind of rumors? <laughs> like, did you know that? I, yeah. I mean, there were some stories, you know, and I, I really did have troubles. Like, yes. I had surgery. and you Yes. Know, uh, so I think those things got kind of amplified as they yeah. went along. Picked, yeah. up, picked up lore and myth. Uh, when this tour was announced, I like took screenshots of it and sent it to those my high school boyfriend from however many years ago in these pictures, and I was like, "It was all bullshit," <laughs> kind of thing, you know, like because it was very mythical at the time for us. Right. Yeah, there was no YouTube. We couldn't Google YouTube and and find you talking to someone or singing or you know what I mean. Like it was really cut or dry. Like, did you write to a fit? We had to write to like a fanzine and be like, "Is this true?" Or you know what I mean? It was so different back then. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> That's my story. Sorry. <laughs> I like it. I mean, and it's interesting that you couldn't, you know, confirm the truth back then, and yet like untruth and misinformation is so widely available now and we can mm -hmm. look it up isn't that weird the claims but it's like we've never been more overtly ignorant or like wrong <laughs> deliberately wrong that's so true wow so like it never gets fixed i think right you know earlier right. we we're talking about like the the pandemic versus 30 years ago without phones without cell phones yeah it's always some can i smoke on this podcast yeah of okay. course great can i smoke on this podcast do you think my baby will mind that i'm smoking in the bedroom i, I mean if you well if the baby's out of you then maybe you between you and <laughs> baby's you. not in your belly so you're all baby good. is definitely out of me and not going back so <laughs> i actually you can smoke i actually have whiskey oh so. and in, in a mason jar Hard i have <laughs> welcome to my my homestead yeah i have I have whiskey. I have some Jamesons in a in a mason jar for this podcast. And actually, before I came in here, my my partner was like, 
is that whiskey? And I was like, and water. And water. It's full. There's some water in there, too. And he's like, I can tell the color of that. There's not very much water. I was like, I'm nervous. (laughs) Like, one of the things we, you know, we've watched the documentary. We've done a ton of research for this interview. Um, But one of the things that I didn't really get a grasp of is kind of your early, like where you personally learned music and some of your early influences. Like, did you grow up in a musical household or? Uh, I didn't. I mean, I I, I have an uncle, had an uncle who's passed away, but my mom's brother was a a really uh, talented country musician and he played stringed instruments, um, lap, lap and pedal steel. Cool. Banjo, guitar, you know, he was a picker. Nice. And, uh, and so as kids, my cousin and I would, would go over to their, his house and like he was this funky, you know, kind of stoner, outlaw country character. Mm-hmm. And just got exposed to that, like his wall of vinyl and just his like shady <laughs> style. Mysterious style. Yeah. There was was there music in your house? Like, did your parents play albums? Oh, yeah, was there... yeah, yeah. Listen to yeah, they were very into like rock and psychedelic, and um, so yeah, there was tons of music. That's awesome. So when did you pick up a guitar? I didn't get it. I got it. I started on drums in middle school when I was in Portland, Oregon, and uh, took drum lessons. And then um, when I moved to LA, I just I met a great drummer, actually, my neighbor. And kind of decided I had to switch to a guitar because he was the drummer. Ah, wow. so I, ju- I just picked it up along the way, and then you know, pretty much taught myself. How with old were you when you picked up the guitar? Uh, probably fifteen. And what about singing? Did you always feel like you had a singing voice? Not at all. No, I did. I I didn't ever think of it really till it was till it started. Um, that song "Shield Your Eyes" was the first song really that I sang and yeah. recorded. I tried like one or two before that, but that was the one that was kind of like came came at once. The clincher. And did you like, like the way your voice sounded or did other people have to tell you like, this is this is good? Oh, I hated it. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. I did not like the sound of it. Still like a real issue. Yeah, I, we've been doing podcasts for six years and I've listened to maybe four of them. <laughs> but it's like hearing your voice on an answering machine. Same thing, right? Like I, but as a singer, you got to have some confidence to get up there and, and go for it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I look back at like the beginning of Jawbreaker was just blind velocity. Yeah. Like, I don't think we were that confident, but I think we were full of energy. And mm. just like, it wasn't like we were dogged or we were dogged, but we weren't determined. We weren't going to make it. We had none of those ambitions, but like it blows my mind how fast that music is. Really? And even at the time, we were like considered melodic mid tempo, you know. But I listen to it now, I'm like, even Dear You, I'm like, Jesus Christ, man, why are we playing this so fast? Really? That's so funny. Are you worried about that on the tour? Have you been doing like Stairmaster cardio workouts? No, no I haven't. But Adam's very good with time. So I, I think he'll, he, and he's always saying, you guys are playing way slow. And we're like, okay. Interesting. Like, well, I think he'll keep it moving. He'll keep it moving. Drummers are amazing to me too, by the way. Let's I'm gonna add that in. Like watching a drummer play a set of like, you know, 20 songs or whatever in punk rock, especially, like, or or hard rock or metal or whatever. Like I I cannot fathom using both my feet, both my hands, occasionally my voice, and carrying that that rhythm, that like fast pace. It's it blows my mind. Yeah, me too. I tend to I tend to watch the drummer in bands more than anyone else i always say i always say i feel like they have like because they're in the back and they're less of the front man i feel like they get less of that kind of spotlight thing but when you do stand and watch them it's amazing yeah bill stevenson i bet you watch him on tour yeah so fun to watch for sure yeah Yeah. so do you remember do you remember your early punk rock influences like the first time you heard punk rock or i do i think the first time i really well the first time i encountered it head on was seeing uh, the decline of Western civilization at a, a, a movie theater in Venice. Like when it first went out, uh, my neighbor took me and I just moved to LA and like, didn't really know about anything. I, I liked rock music, you know, and I like new wave, like what I'd heard of that. 
but my friend, my neighbor, who was the drummer, took me and we went to a, a night show of Decline, and it was like this kind of crash course because you got X and the Germs and Black Flag and Circle Jerks. And, Good grief! So like wow. All the kids in one <laughs> shot, in a way. And the next thing I knew, like I was started in a new high school, and some ladies from the high school took took me along with them to see like a punkathon at the Hollywood Palladium. And it was social distortion and youth brigade and oh my gosh, seven hugely influential bands. So it was kind of it all happened very quickly, and LA had such a rich, you know, culture going on at that point of like early punk and hardcore West Coast style that I just kind of got dropped right into it. About how old were you? I was wherever you start high school, fourteen or yeah. fifteen. Yeah. That seems to be when we all got hit, no matter what the decade, no matter what the year, that like really influential, emotional, hormonal, uh, like pushing the boundaries, the first step out on your own from your family and your parents and your freedom and your driver's license, all those things. It seems to be when we all sort of got hit with that, right? Like that, that's like that short window of opportunity where you start to like expand your life a little bit outside of like elementary school and family and that kind of thing. I want to be that age again <laughs> for like two days. I do not. Yeah. For like yeah. two days. Give me, give me like a, give me a couple days and I'm good. <laughs> but that's a fun age, that discovery age. Right. And holy fuck, like just the names that you just listed that you got to discover at that age. Like, wow. I was, I think I was really lucky. Adam and I were both, we were at the same high school and we're like, I think we consider ourselves really lucky to have just been kind of dropped into that mayu. And the other thing that was cutting in at another angle was, well, there were two really great strands that, that helped me a lot as a songwriter and like as a listener was, there was the kind of like Paisley underground with the dream syndicate and like green on red and all these kind of neo psychedelic bands that were um, opal, just cool, like really cool weird bands that were playing and then there was sst was kind of like becoming this very eclectic roster so seeing the minutemen and the meat puppets and like mm. saccharine trust you know and those bands um it was great because you'd find your label you would just kind of trust like that the way you'd find discord or something we'd see sst records is always going to put out something off the wall and exciting and do you yeah. remember at that time there being a lot of girls in the crowd, a lot of front girl, like female people being around, or was it mostly males? No, it was it was very, it was much more eclectic. I think that what I remember is a lot of women being around because the early. I mean, I, first of all, because I was like a tiny boy. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone looked like a woman, probably, but they because they were of age to be at clubs, you know. Right. But there were like a lot of. I think like the early LA scene was more art damage than it gets recognized for which included women all kinds of people kind of outliers you know coming together around this culture of like art music political discourse whatever it wasn't just like punk rock american style but it was more like punk was something you you could do in huh. addition to your sculpting or your you know <laughs> That's awesome. Whatever they're doing, like downtown LA was right. Vibrant, you know, and that was like, there were a lot of women in that world. Yeah. You know? A lot of transgressive filmmakers, storytellers, whatever, musicians. So I, I do remember women being there. Less so as it went along, though. I think it became much more masculine and kind of male, male dominated. Do you feel, okay, so like if we if we talk about Jawbreaker in the early days and you're performing, um, was there, what about the female influence then? Was your crowd full of men? Was it full of women? Was it full of both? What, what do you feel like back then was for you guys it, as your you band? Know, it probably was much more male than I mm -hmm. remember, but like Gilman was a very mixed scene. And like that, and that really Gilman was a big part of our kind of connecting with the community. You know, they were the they were the open door up north when we were struggling in L.A. And like and that was I won't say it's equal men and women, but it was it was definitely like there were a lot. There was a very female presence at, 
yeah at bay area shows um, do you still have people in your life um friends from the gilman days oh yeah 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 a lot surprising number number of them i don't know if you've experienced this but as i get older like i make less friends <laughs> mm -hmm. and, so i have like a lot of friends not a lot but i have fr key friends from high school yeah and then from that early kind of like music part of my life yeah yeah you know, a lot of people a lot of that sf crowd is pretty intact strangely like the mission kind of epicenter maximum the group that's still around is is in touch in interesting and oblique ways that's awesome yeah. that's cool to hear does that feel like a hometown show a little bit when you go there it very much so yeah 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 of all the of all the shows on this tour which one's your hometown show do you feel like if you're a label one uh For you know, honestly, LA is like the biggest um, challenge, uh -huh. in a way, and also usually a, like one of the warmest receptions, <laughs> which surprises me even. But I think I remember being a kid in LA and going to shows and being like, like when I saw Government Issue in Hollywood, and like not a lot of people were there. I was so happy that they had bothered. Yeah, a, a shitty club, you know, and so I kind of try to remember that that like the happiness in LA is the people who don't always get counted, but who actually live in that area and and love it when bands come there. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel living like in the middle of fucking nowhere. Like, and right now with COVID, like, so Vancouver is my closest show that I can go to. Essentially, Vancouver is where if bands hit the West Coast, that's where they go. But with COVID, nobody's crossing the border, so all of these tours are being announced and nobody's coming across the border. So of everything that's been announced in the last, you know, six months, nothing is even an option for me essentially. And uh, so like when a band does come this far or, you know, like cross the board, like things like that, like I've always been appreciative even before COVID, but, um, but yeah, it's, that's cool that you, you remember that sort of appreciation from a fan perspective there. I try to keep it alive, you know, because it's easy to be um, jaded about a city like L.A. I mean, it is it is like a a market, you know, and you have to kind of consider that a little bit like. Wow, we're going to be playing before uh, in the way that people think of New York, like before crossed arms and executives and people like standing askance. <laughs> you know? um, but the feeling actually in L.A. is usually really really warm nice so yeah i like it i like that that exists in places you think it wouldn't yeah i guess to answer your question i don't know if i have a hometown show anymore I, i've been in new york longer than i've been anywhere else so this is my home yeah, yeah. how do you feel um looking back at all, all the lyrics that you wrote so many years ago and you're singing them now do you feel like you still they're still relatable do you do you hate them do you like them do you appreciate how young you were when you wrote all those you're allowed to say you hate them it's okay people still like them I do, no I, I i like them i don't hate them uh i think as i've become better friends with myself uh, like part of my own like progress as a human i've uh I've come to appreciate, see the lyrics, the truth in those lyrics more. So I, I don't, I don't think I sing any that I don't like. Um, yeah. Fortunately, the ones people like, I still like too. <clears throat> That's a bonus. You know, so we don't have to like not play something. But no, I accept them. I mean, there are some, so there's some early ones that I think are pretty whack. You know, I can look at that and go like, hey, okay. See, like, I look back at my old diaries from when I was, like, that age, and I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you weirdo. You know what I mean? So, like, but obviously songwriting is a little bit different because it, you're you're putting it out there for, for the like, the public to consume and stuff like that. But <laughs> my, my diary is not, which, thank God. But um, we actually, I, I kind of put on one of the Jawbreaker fan clubs on Facebook. I don't know if you pay attention to them or not. Some bands do. Some bands sort of like privately lurk and keep an eye on it and stuff. But um, kind of in prepping for this interview, I had posted on one of the fan clubs saying, you know, if there was to be an interview with Jawbreaker or 
you know, Blake, that sort of thing. What would you guys want to know? And there was kind of a list of a few things, but we had this one guy write us this massive email and it was so wonderful and it was so heartfelt. And I kind of feel like I I have to touch on it because A, he's going to be listening (laughs) and B, I thought it was really interesting. So um, he's a man in his like late forties and he works with other men in mental health right now. Um, And he said that at the time that Jawbreaker was a big influence on his life, it was a time in society and in his family specifically that um, being an emotional man was not okay. You didn't talk about your problems. You didn't talk about your feelings. You didn't cry. You didn't um, like share any of that kind of deep emotion. And he said that for him, what this, what your band, what Jawbreaker meant to him was like, it's okay to like talk about how you feel and it's okay to express it. And, um, you know, like listening to your music and crying or being at a show and getting emotional and that sort of thing. And he said, your band sort of influenced him as a, as a man to allow him to show those emotions and be okay with it. And I thought that was a super cool email to get because, you know, I cry at shows all the time. We joke about it often. I'm usually the girl at the front row that just can't keep my shit together because I'm just loving it so much. But it's different for a man. And especially back, you know, 25 years ago when the facade of men don't cry, men don't show emotion. So I just sort of thought that I'd love to hear your comment on that. But also, did you know that you were having that kind of impact on people? Did you recognize that emotion? Did you see other males in your audience connecting with your music that way? Like, is that something you're aware of? Yeah, we, I think we saw it. Um, I think our partners saw it more than we did. Mm. The women women that we were with would always say like, it's only the men who are watching you with like love, love and eyes. Uh, And I always found that interesting, you know, maybe you can't see it because you're playing, but they were very keen to it. Like, you have male groupies. Yeah. I hear a lot. Like, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I think bands and artists did that for me. You know, yeah. I think Sinead O'Connor and Bjork and um, the Pogues were bands that all made me really like shockingly emotional mm-hmm. to myself. I was just surprised at how much I was like getting teary to that. Yeah. Music. But, and I come from a line of uh, Swiss, <laughs> hard to read, inscrutable men, you know? Um, I think my family was surprised when I opened up my mouth and just shouted because mm. we were always a little more polite. So, I'm, I'm happy to be uh, helpful. I think <laughs> it's cool. And this, this was... First of all, like, that's that's my big thing, really. Well, it's interesting because, like, this specific person who wrote this email... And he was like, he, he really phrased it like it's not a question. He just sort of wanted to share that experience. And like, it's interesting how he was that young man who wasn't allowed to show emotion and then credits your music for allowing that to happen. And now he's helping other men. Like, that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Hey, man, men need help. You know, they do. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm, it kind of begs this question, though, like now we have all these emotional men who are fucking nightmares. <laughs> Really, isn't this like, isn't the GOP fucking emo? There All you go. Incel dudes are like way too expressive and open about their fucking feelings. See, and Kristen's raising two sons, and I'm raising a son now as well. And that's something that is on my mind on the regular basis on like trying to raise a, a male person who is is allowed to show how he feels, right? But then um, at some point, suck it up. At some point, we all have to fucking suck it up. We yeah. all do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Do we just take it a step harsh there? No, <laughs> well, well, I agree. I mean, like the filter, you know, the, um, the super ego. Like it, yes. has, it, it has a function. And, yes. Um, I don't know. We're in such a bizarre moment of this kind of libidinal hate raptor that like is, is pub political discourse and like this is like cruelty bonanza <laughs> yeah 
for sure. monetized, monetized like viciousness and like it's such a clear path to power and everyone's just capitalizing on it yeah and, yeah uh, yeah i mean i can imagine raising sons would be like a huge task right i mean raising humans is fucking hard raising humans is hard i'm raising one of each and both both of them are perspectively like completely mind fucking crazy but yeah like uh raising a son feels a little bit it feels definitely different for me do you still write a lot blake uh i do i i do kind of drawing and visual art and Mm -hmm. and writing almost in one book um finding like color is kind of where my voice is right now hmm. so like yeah i just go where the uh, en- energy is in a way whether it's guitar or pens or, or words and try and like i just feel so like uh i don't know what the word is like i want to do something <laughs> creative every day a little bit and wherever that get it out to happen yeah i try to kind of go to it so do you make yourself do that even on days that you're not feeling it i just have the the materials ready and um yeah i can't i'm not very good at forcing like stuff that i'm gonna end up liking but it Mm -hmm. you know i've had a pretty healthy relationship with it lately i think we're kind of low grade like i'm not i'm not a very ambitious person but when i work when i work i am ambitious like in those moments it's very concentrated yeah. it yeah. seems like love, with our i love to do nothing like i <sighs> cannot tell you how much i like to just sit and watch swedish police procedurals my cats and my food like that to me is i could retire okay. okay if you could sit right now and spend the next hour watching one thing and eating one thing what would you be watching what would you be eating well i'm right right now i'm re-watching beck the uh swedish cop drama Okay. Uh, Weird. Oh, <laughs> Not what I was expecting. The best thing ever made for uh, for Swedish television. Okay. And what so, are you snacking on? What are you eating? I would be having, um, God, what is the thing then? I mean, it's got to have avocado in it. And mm. probably, uh, what do I eat all the time? I don't know. If you could just like indulge for the next hour, if you could like really just go for it, what would you be eating? If I could go for it. Like, go for it. Like, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to make you fat. It's not going to affect your bowel movements. It's really just going to, like, make you feel wonderful in the moment of eating it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm going to say nachos. Yes. Yeah. There you go. You know, oh, like, good, but good nachos. Not None of this, like, Velveeta shit. You know, it'd be, like, everything great melted down. Like, the centerfold of Trace Ombres, that CZ Top record. <laughs> all in one yeah i like my nachos burnt i'm sorry i'm just gonna say that i like them i like the cheese burnt a little bit we can carry on with blackened top yeah i like a little harsh smoked gouda yeah oh it it was like a power snack because i went out early (laughs) early this morning and was like walking in the freezing cold and i came home and i remembered that i had some smoked oysters yes and so i had smoked oysters and gouda and triscuits Mm. with some pepperoncinis and a little like Frise, dude yeah it was pretty fucking solid it was like you sometimes your body just tells you like yeah this i could eat pepper and a whole jar of those little spicy pepper things oh, just great. in one sitting so wonderful <laughs> <laughs> i'm curious to get back to your creative process a little bit like, I <laughs> I mean, know, I'm, like, I'm, like I'm sorry heavy. i was into she's the heavy i wanted to talk about the nachos but okay we can get back go go i'm just wondering do you have actual notebooks around your house like that you that you write in that you draw in and oh i have tons of them yeah yeah yes i mean i always have like one or two going yeah and the million dollar question is are you writing jawbreaker songs uh and my answer which is probably a five dollar answer is like i'm trying i'm really trying okay. i think the way that the historically the way the songs have come together is they're just they're they're already written in different parts of different books Mm -hmm. a lot of times and i kind of tend to cobble things together or find the germ that will then spawn the 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 rest of the text into the conclusion of the song it seems like pieces 
it seems like like with the like what you were talking about with like the political climate and what's happening in our world and like this like crazy shit that we live in right now it seems like the perfect storm for jawbreaker songs just i wonder it's like it's so we're in such a weird uh moment because to engage is to bite down on the troll candy in a way Mm -hmm. right And and i think that's the real trick of like of the far right is this kind of it's kind of this like weird perverse coup of of information is to make everything bait definitely bait you know and like you have to acknowledge it and combat it and all of that but they've almost made it so so like malignant that if you engage in any way you're indulging it like i don't want my art to be about any of this shit yeah you know, i don't want to spend my living life like the living part of my life dealing with this shit i'll I do that love that work you know i'll do that outside of this but i don't want them in my world yeah and they so pollute your worldview right now like it just feels so corrupt everywhere you know it's really interesting like and we are obviously mabel syndrome our podcast and what we do is obviously not on the level of a musician or what you what you do or create but like we have this like fine balance to walk to of like people constantly coming at us being like you don't support this why don't you support that why don't you why aren't you an activist for this you have to stick up for this like we get this like crazy influx of if you don't speak up for it if you don't talk about it if you don't promote it if you don't stand against it then you're obviously either a shithead or you're not an activist or you're not you're part of the problem and like Kristen and I struggle with it on a regular basis because there's obviously causes and things we support or there's certain ways we feel I'm Canadian. She's American. We both have fucked up shit going in our countries, you know, and things like that. But like also at the same time, that's not our, our platform. It's not our art. It's not who, you know what I mean? Like, so I can relate to that to some degree, but I really like how you put it. Like, I don't want that shit infiltrating my art. I don't want to spend my living days with that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that's where we're turning for like help, really. Yeah. Like what you're plunging into when you're trying to like repair your mind and your your faith and things. Yeah. Is, you know, I will read like I read a lot of Black history, um, and I do find that healing and like and helpful. Um, but I'm also reading like philosophy or crazy fiction or whatever, like. Mm-hmm. You know, there's refuge, places of refuge that, are, that don't involve this yes. fight, this pitched battle for now. Yes. Um, I don't know. I try did to remember that. Did I see somewhere that you were studying I, for I, the... Oh, did I see somewhere that you were studying for the LSAT, maybe? The LSAT? Oh, that was my cat. Oh, that wasn't real? No. <laughs> well, I, was, I, was, I was speaking about my cat i think because he was oh. very focused or he was looking very focused right yeah. oh we we legit thought that's what you were doing and starting a very huge tour like we were we were ready to have a whole conversation about it but i'm relieved it's your cat because i feel better for you now i'm like wow I, that takes a lot off you i'm not kim kardashian over here all right, I, right, I, right. i'm not that good that's so good. I love it. I love that it's a cat. Well, that makes the, the that like I really couldn't follow that conversation because I don't know much about it. So I feel much more relieved now because I can talk about your cat, but I don't know about the LSAT. So, so I feel are you good. Still, are you still teaching at a local college? I'm not. No, I, okay. I uh, yeah, I left that a while ago. Um, I did go. I went back and got my master's uh, maybe ten years ago or something, which was probably the best best thing I ever did mm-hmm. in my adult life. Why is that? I, I, well, I think I was, it was a good time. I was ready to learn finally. Yeah. Like I was finally ready to go to the institution by myself and like pay for it. Mm-hmm. It was city college, so I could pay for it. And um, yeah. it was a great program, Hunter College. Well, shout out uh, CCMY, you know, and, um, and I, and I, 
I got really into it. I had nothing else in my life and it really like got me to f- kind of focus on one thing and just, I was determined not to fuck it up. And so I really threw myself into it. And, um, and now I, like, I feel like a bigger person. <laughs> That's cool. Well, MA I can put after my name. Right. ABS MA. And what's your master's in? English literature. Awesome. That's, That's cool. Great. Yeah. I, How did you like teaching? I, I, I have, I think most teachers would say this at the, at the adjunct level. Like I was really, I learned more than I taught. I have a feeling. Um, I learned about how hard it is to teach and how cool and unpredictable students are. <laughs> um, when I did connect with them, I was really happy personally, you know, yeah. like I got thrilled on my own dime. When you become aware of what that process is of like a transmission of knowledge and like I had it in, in grad school actually with my kind of ment- my advisor, um, I studied romantic literature, particularly Shelley and Keats and seeing how this person taught, I began to kind of, I was, I was adjuncting at the time. So I was always looking for models, you know, I'm like, how do you teach? How do people teach? How do good teachers teach? And seeing someone who is really good at, at a little bit of like the breadcrumb trail, like leaving a few pieces, but like being incredibly discreet about it and like having people find their way to information and, you know, it was, it was so cool. It's such a subtle, like art. I didn't quite have that. You know, I was, I was a little impatient, I think, but maybe I do it in other ways. I'd like to think I'd like to do that in art to leave little pieces. Um, I did, I did have one kind of interesting question that I kind of wanted to touch on. And that was, um, the collector side of things with Jawbreaker. So I'm a collector of albums and vinyl and memorabilia for a specific couple bands, obviously the millions of face to face things hanging behind me and stuff. And as a collector, um, there's a really big um, fan base of Jawbreaker that collects your stuff. And I just had this curious question of like, do you follow that kind of thing? Do you see what your stuff is going for? Like, and do you like go on to Discogs and check out your memorabilia and stuff? Because you have albums going for $500, you know, things like that and cassette tapes and demo tapes that are, people are sought after. Do you follow that kind of stuff? What, as the musician, what, how do you feel about that kind of stuff that fans are searching for and willing to pay $500 for a vinyl album? I don't, I don't follow that stuff. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So I don't have feelings about it. Okay. Really. Does it blow your mind to think that somebody is willing to spend $500 on something you put out? No, because people are willing to spend $500 for, I don't know. Shitty things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. It's like, a, fa- so. yeah. It's a really interesting part of, of being a fan too, right? Like I, I, there's certain things that I've spent a lot of money on for like that, just because I love the collecting aspect of it. But I, there, and of course, a lot of bands have that following, but I find Jawbreaker fans are actually really intense about it. Like, like your stuff is very sought after. And I, I just, yeah, I think it's cool that you have no idea. I think it's cool that you don't care. <laughs> We've always had intense fans. Your fans are intense. It's very intense. true. I've Do you feel that? People. Well, I've been told by, you know, bands who play with us unless we ask yeah. our friends to play and they're like, it's not very <laughs> fun opening for you guys because everyone's just like, and I feel pretty about that. You know, I feel bad for like the bands we like that people are just like not giving the time of day. Do you have like some really good fan stories about like some really fucking intense fans? You must. You must have some people. I'm sure I do, but yeah, the better the story, the worse the story in a way. Right. When it comes to that. Right. Yeah, I imagine like the emotional intensity of your music and your fans must get pretty crazy. It'll I'm, be interesting to see who comes out to this to this tour too. If it'll be fans 
from back in the day, if it'll be new fans, if it'll be people with their kids, who knows what it'll be, but that'll yeah. be interesting to see. I think it's been, I mean, so far it's kind of been both, which is really for, fortunate for us that there's younger people who found out about us after the fact and like yeah. it. Um, other bands that mentioned us and then got people into it. And then there's like people from our, our age group that are just coming out as adults. More mm -hmm. and more. And like the, the crowd feels really good. Like the yeah. group of people feel like friendly, yeah. sane, relatively sane. <laughs> they get it like that. That's nice. And you know, like you, we, as we touched on before, like all these other bands that are playing with you guys, also have these really incredible fan bases like you said to make that little magic mix right like like the face-to-face -face shows and stuff and the descendant shows and the people coming out to see the linda lindas as well as you guys like i think that this is just my assumption being a fan of many of these bands including jawbreakers like it's going to be some pretty fucking magical shows for you guys on this tour it's going to be pretty insane i think that I think that people that get to see this are are very very lucky. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sorry, I, I had. To... I wish we could take a trip up to Vancouver Island for you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've been I've been like I've been pricing out flights to Denver. I've been pricing out flights to California. I've been pricing out. I've been obsessing over it because you know my seventeen year old self goes. A will never see Jawbreaker play together again, and that's fucking devastating. And Face to Face is touring their last album before they're done, and that's also devastating. There's a whole bunch of devastating things happening on this tour. Basically, I'll just be crying at the shows anyway, so it's okay. But I, uh, I'm just really excited for you guys on this tour. I think it's going to be really wonderful, and I, I, uh, I can't wait to see how people react to it. It's going to be really great. Ah, well, thank you. That sounds that sounds good. That sounds. Sorry, fun. I had to have I had to have a fan moment. This has been pretty much a great interview. I'm like beside myself, happy that we got this chance. You know, um, we were told that it would be impossible to get you to talk to us. Really? Yeah, we were we were we were told by a few that like good luck, not going to happen, and so we sort of we sort of threw it out there and talked about it for a while, and you said yes, so we're super grateful for that. <laughs> Maybe that's just somebody fucking with us. I don't know. But like we we were really, really set up for the fact that it wasn't going to happen. And the fact that it did, we're pretty thankful. I'm really excited that you yeah, thank sat you down so with much. us. Sure. I mean, yeah, we don't, we're not really doing press per se. Mm -hmm. But I think probably because, I don't know, you seem like a unique podcast and it's not going to be like a sausage fest, I'll say. It, right. Yeah, it's true. Um, that probably looked more interesting. I don't really know, but it kind of went, it did bounce through a couple of people and like mm -hmm. Adam, Adam ended up sending me the thing saying, do you want to do this podcast? And I thought, sure. So that's kind of how we do our disorganized. Yeah. Well, that's cool. You know, we, we, um, when we started this out as two female fans in the punk rock scene, we just sort of started it out for the two of us, hoping to connect with some other women. And over the years, people have said yes to us and, we never ever thought in a million years that we would be sitting here doing something like this. And, um, and it turns out that a lot of people say yes to us because they think like, wow, it's not two dudes sitting around talking about the same shit <laughs> to be honest. And we try to, we try to go that way a little bit, but yeah, we're super thankful for, uh, for you sitting down with us because um, people are going to be really excited to hear from you. So, yeah. Like I'm it. super excited. I'm my 17 year old, inside me is like losing her shit right now with this whiskey in a mason jar so <laughs> yeah. well um everybody needs to uh i mean there's not very many tickets left but we are we'll promote that we're promoting the shit out of it out of it there's for a couple you shows, a couple shows that still have tickets a couple shows that still have tickets and um we hope that this tour is super successful and fun and amazing and creates all that little magic stuff that you talked about um, on this tour awesome for the next if, few uh, months. Jawbreaker plays another festival like punk rock bowling or something like that. So we'll, we'll keep fingers crossed for one of those. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully this gets us invited to a couple festivals. It will. Oh yeah. It'll happen. What do you, what do you mean invited? Do you have to be invited? Can't you just be like, I'm coming? Uh, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> punk rock royalty. You have to be able to be like, I'm showing up. Give yeah, me, a, we'll give me a stage. <laughs> 
you know, I mean, I don't always love the punk rock festivals. Mm. And why is that? <laughs> Say it. Larry Say Dan. it. Well, I'm not sure, but it, it seems a little chummy. Like, mm. we're not like-minded with all punk bands. No, all U.S. punk bands, you know? So, I don't know. Sometimes the culture, I don't agree with it entirely. Interesting. Um, um, they terrify me. I don't go. <laughs> there's too many. There's more people at those festivals than in my hometown. So, I'm like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just true of festival. I mean, now we live in this festival era, but, like, some are cool and kind of mm -hmm. fun and, and weird. And, and some are just, like, going to the Super Bowl or something. And But you did Riot Fest. Riot Fest was great. Uh, Forgetters back in the day played Fun, Fun, Fun in Austin. That was really cool. Yeah. That I saw, despite my my instincts, like that they could be actually kind of neat. 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 <laughs> neat event, you know. I want to go to a, I want to yeah. go to a neat festival. Yeah, neat <laughs> festival. Like very tidy, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, but I mean, I've seen good Primavera. We played that in, in Barcelona. That was really cool. Some are cool, and then some just are kind of. The European festivals seem different. I haven't been to them, obviously, but like the feedback and the vibe and the feeling and like what people say, it seems like uh, European festivals are different. I think they do it. They've been doing it maybe a lot, little longer. The big youth festivals. Yeah. We played like a hardcore festival in in uh, Belgium. A couple, years, a couple years ago recently and that was pretty gnarly <laughs> <laughs> it sounds terrifying that to me I, US, like thrash core festival whew. i mean they're fun they took care of us they did a good job but it, it was like familiar in a way right <laughs> that's interesting no thank you <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for doing this and and spending your saturday with us it really means a lot thank you no i i liked it i had a good time that's good thank you